Right now, on to the point. A father back in court, his 10-year-old son accused of killing another 10-year-old. The calls for justice and how kids are processing the news. Plus, tackling violent crimes, the federal government's new plan. Could it help bridge gaps in Sacramento? Another shelter opening for the unhoused, the impact it will have. And later on the back roads, the clown-themed hotel that prides itself on scaring guests. This place called the Clown Motel, the scariest motel in the United States. Thank you for joining us on To The Point. I'm Alex Bell. First tonight, the father of a 10-year-old accused of shooting and killing another 10-year-old was back in court. Investigators say the man threw away the gun his son allegedly used in the shooting and is facing charges including child endangerment and possessing a gun as a felon. Our Becca Hobbegger was in the courtroom today and has more on what the victim's family is now saying. I need somebody to care. Everybody got chilled. This could have been anybody's child. Brittany Frierson lost her 10 year old son, Keith KJ Frierson, in last Saturday's shooting. Family and community advocates spoke outside the Sacramento County Main Jail Friday morning after 53 year old Arquette Davis appeared in court. Department 61 is now in session. Davis's appearance lasted around 30 seconds, with his attorney, Linda Parisi, requesting a continuation of the hearing until next Wednesday, which the judge granted. Meanwhile, Davis remains in jail without bond. Certainly, this case is a tragedy. There's been a loss of life of a young person. Two families are truly devastated by this series of events, but we need to investigate the case and see what the legal status is. His charges are tied to something the Sacramento County Sheriff's Office says his 10-year-old son did. On the afternoon of December 30th, investigators say Davis's son took a gun out of his dad's car and shot another boy, KJ. KJ's family says it happened while neighbor kids were playing outside. We tell him to get off the games and go outside. My baby was outside. Davis has a felony criminal record and is therefore not allowed to have a firearm, sheriff's officials say. They also say Davis threw the gun into a trash can after the shooting. His charges now include criminal storage of a firearm, endangering the life and safety of a child, and destroying evidence. This is a unusual circumstances, again, very tragic, but they need to be fully researched. ABC 10 spoke with Davis's mother outside the courtroom. She said her grandson, the alleged shooter, is now home with family. The boy initially faced a murder charge but the Sacramento County District Attorney's Office dropped that, telling ABC 10 Davis will be the only person they hold criminally liable for KJ's death. To let the child go so early, so fast in the proceedings could almost be negligence on the part of our society. Community youth advocate Barry Axius says he and the family hold both the father and his son responsible and want to see accountability. How can a kid so comfortably pick up a gun? This isn't something that you just do because you have not seen it before, who is he mimicking? Is it someone in his house? The accused shooter's grandmother tells ABC 10 the boy's actions were unintentional. KJ's family disagrees. This was not an accident. This was not an accident. This was not an accident. And KJ's family says they have a meeting on Tuesday with the Sacramento County District Attorney's Office, and that's where they will learn more about why the DA chose not to criminally charge the 10-year-old boy. And this shooting, it can be very traumatic for kids, and counselors will be available to KJ's classmates next week. Today, I spoke with Mindy Russell, who is a local chaplain with years of experience in post-trauma care, and most recently, she actually worked with students from Uvalde Elementary School. And she says that processing an event such as a shooting can be unchartered territory for children children and they need support. When something traumatic happens to a child, um, depending on where they are, if they visibly saw it or if they've imagined by hearing other people talk about it, it's still traumatic to them. So the families uh, must address it by letting the children first talk about it, letting them hear where they are in that picture that they've taken of that trauma. I also asked what behaviors parents should be aware of if their child may be acting differently after a traumatic event. She had this to say. They might, at 10 years old, uh, start acting like they did when they were six years old, when they sucked their thumb or had an imaginary friend or their teddy bear or having a hard time sleeping. So we encourage parents and educators not to normalize the abnormal. If they're doing something they've never done before, address it. 
and tonight there's new perspective about combating violent crimes in our communities. U.S. Attorney General Merrick Garland highlighted the Department of Justice's ongoing efforts and he says more than 500 gun purchases have been blocked since a new gun law requiring background checks for young people went into effect and the law passed in June of 2022 requires extra checks for any gun purchases by people under age 21 and the FBI has also reported that the number of homicides fell over 6% nationally between 2021 and 2022 but Garland says there is still more that needs to be done. As part of that strategy we have been bringing to bear our technological tools including advanced ballistics analysis firearms tracing, crime gun intelligence centers, and local fusion cells to support joint law enforcement investigations to identify the principal sources of violent crime in specific local communities. Along with these efforts, Garland says they are focusing on strengthening Project Safe Neighborhoods. Sacramento participates in this project and has helped bring indictments in several violent crime and gun violence cases. In other news, the man accused of a series of stabbings in Davis back in April 2023 will stand trial. Today, a judge reinstated competency for Carlos Dominguez. A state hospital report in late December said Dominguez is now competent, reversing a decision made over the summer, and the defense didn't make any challenges on his competency. Dominguez was also ordered to be involuntarily, involuntarily medicated. A preliminary hearing is set for February 26th. Developing tonight, Stockton police are investigating a shooting in a parking lot on East Hammer Lane. Here's ABC 10's Gabriel Porras with what we know so far. Well, the investigation here is wrapping up, but the scene is still pretty active right now behind me. Stockton police investigating after gunfire erupted in broad daylight, leaving at least two men hurt. Police tell us that the 25 year old and 30 year old victims both had non life threatening injuries. The shooting happened around 1 in the afternoon today outside a strip mall near Hammer and West Lanes in North Stockton. This parking lot has been closed off ever since with dozens of evidence markers all over the ground here. We have also seen what appear to be bullet holes in several parked cars. Police say that they do not yet know the motive behind this shooting and as police search for the shooter tonight they are asking anyone who might have seen what happened here to give investigators a call. This weekend family and friends of Sacramento native Tyree Nichols will gather with community leaders to mark one year since his death. Nichols died in 2023 after a violent traffic stop with police in Memphis Tennessee and five officers have been charged so far in connection with his death. The Tyree Nichols Foundation family and friends and council member Lisa Kaplan's office have organized a candlelight vigil at the skate park Nichols spent time at. It will be held Sunday evening at the Tyree Nichols Skate Park in Natomas. Now to the homeless crisis tonight. Starting next week, up to 240 homeless residents in Sacramento will have access to sleeping cabins and trailers. And this comes five months after city officials voted to give city manager Howard Chan the power of finding and opening new safe camping sites. The new 7.5 acre site at Roseville Road is set to house 60 sleeping cabins and 40 trailers, most of which were previously used during the peak of the pandemic at Cal Expo. This project will now bring us up to 1,350 temporary beds every single night in Sacramento. Other buildings on the campus will provide office space for service providers, including behavioral health specialists. Those who will be living in the new shelters will be screened prior, and the city says that they plan to open more sites soon, including one on Stockton Boulevard. All right, coming up on to the point, what's next for Sacramento's District 2? When could someone take Council Member Lilloe's seat? Clear skies right now and cold temperatures, but the next storm system ready to head in. How much rain and snow we're expecting to see in the forecast? And tonight on the back roads, how you can sleep tight at the world famous Clown Motel that includes a cemetery next door. If this goes off yellow, that means they're near you. And if it goes off red, it means they're on top of you. So we have some changes in the forecast. We actually have some watches and warnings mm -hmm. going to effect. So meteorologist Carly Gomez yep. here to break it all down for us. I am. We're getting that storm system arriving in the early morning hours. The watches and warnings in place will be the winter storm warning. That goes into effect at 4 a.m. And the winter weather advisory up high 
going into effect at 7 a.m. Now we're going to expect to see snow falling closer to about 9 a.m. So they're issuing that a little early to prepare people heading up the hill. And we are going to get a lot of snow and a lot of that coming in as much as two inches per hour as we move into the afternoon and evening. That'll really ramp up those snowfall rates, but also dropping snow levels down to even as low as 2,000 feet as that cold air begins to move in from the Gulf of Alaska. Now, the st storm is going to be dropping the snow levels even until Sunday morning. Could be as low as about 1,000 feet, although we aren't expecting moisture at that point in time. So unfortunately, those near Auburn may not be seeing any flurries at all. Valley rain and gusts will begin moving in with patchy morning frost as well. That low pressure we're tracking is expected to start moving in in the next 12 hours with the clouds rolling in first into the early morning hours. Then we get the snow around 9 a.m. and some of the showers on the coastline. By noon, you're seeing a whole solid line of showers pushing through the foothills into Sacramento, Elk Grove towards Stockton, Santa Rosa, Fairfield, and then moving down into Southern California by 8 p.m. Things really do start clearing out for the most part in the valley, but we're still looking at snowfall in the Sierra at least until the late night. We'll start clearing out and expect to see some areas of patchy morning frost as well from Sunday as well as Monday mornings as we'll see temperatures near freezing point. We could expect up to about a foot of snow to maybe a foot and a half for the peaks near the passes. Temperature wise will be dropping down low 50s for most of the week, but overnight lows really cold even near freezing point. Still ahead on to the point, presidential candidates hit the campaign trail. President Biden's message to Trump in his first speech of the year. Plus, what's next for City Council's District 2 seat after Sean Lalowey's resignation? The candidates you'll see on your March ballot. Now to the 2024 presidential election. President Joe Biden is jumpstarting his reelection campaign. He just held his first speech of the year in Valley Forge, Pennsylvania, directly naming and attacking his predecessor, Donald Trump. And this as Republican presidential candidates campaign across Iowa ahead of the Iowa caucuses. In Battleground, Pennsylvania, President Joe Biden kickstarting his reelection campaign in his first major speech of 2024. Today, we're here to answer the most important of questions. Is democracy still America's sacred cause? His remarks near Valley Forge, a key location for General George Washington's Continental Army during the American Revolution. The president drawing sharp contrast between Washington and former President Donald Trump. Trump won't do what an American president must do. I'll say what Donald Trump won't. Political violence is never, ever acceptable in the United States political system. Never, never, never. This event and a new Biden-Harris campaign ad timed to coincide with the third anniversary of the deadly January 6th attack on the U.S. Capitol. There's something dangerous happening in America. There's an extremist movement that does not share the basic beliefs in our democracy. Meanwhile, Republican presidential candidates like former U.N. Ambassador Nikki Haley and Florida Governor Ron DeSantis are in Iowa, ahead of the caucuses in less than two weeks. Donald Trump is running for his issues. Nikki Haley is running for her donors' issues. I'm running for your issues. There's a reason 75% of Americans don't want a Trump-Biden rematch. They're tired. They want to see something go forward. But in the latest polls, the two candidates still far trailing the front runner, Donald Trump, who's also in the state campaigning tonight. Trump's events expected to collide with numerous court dates this election year after he was charged in four criminal cases in 2023. And new tonight, the U.S. Supreme Court says that it will consider the appeal of former President Donald Trump's disqualification from the Colorado GOP primary ballot. The court said oral arguments for Thursday, February 8th. Tonight, questions remain about what's next for Sacramento City Council's District 2 seat. After Sean Lalowey resigned just yesterday, we spoke to those in Lalowey's district about their concerns. We have a huge budget process we're going through in our city. It's a tremendous amount of meet, need right now for, our, for the businesses on El Paso Boulevard. We need some consistency. We need answers. As to who will fill the seat remains unknown. Mayor Daryl Steinberg may have to appoint someone until a new council member is elected. He says that he is not going to do that until after the March 5th primary. Let's not fill it with a caretaker now. Let's see if somebody wins. Um, and, and appoint that person if they win. And these are the candidates running for District 2 in the March primary this year. Nine people are listed on the county's candidate report. 
If one of those candidates does not get more than 50% of the vote, then the top two vote getters will go to a runoff election in November. And if that happens, then Mayor Steinberg says the city will appoint someone until the seat is filled. Tonight, the possibility of another government shutdown remains a concern. And Josh, at the end of 2023, Congress passed a spending package, but deadlines are coming up again in just a few weeks. And we spoke with Representative Josh Harder about how a government shutdown could impact our area. If there a, is a government shutdown, it's going to be hard for the VA clinic in Stockton to hire more doctors, which is going to increase wait times for our veterans that need help. It's going to close Social Security offices when folks absolutely uh, need their retirement benefits to, to, to keep coming. What the shutdown could also mean is funding cuts to things like hiring of wildland firefighters in our state. There are two federal deadlines, January 19th and February 2nd. Congress will need to act to avoid a government shutdown. Next on To The Point, we hit the back roads, how you can sleep tight at the world famous Clown Motel. It's Friday, which means it's time for another trip on the back roads. And tonight, John Bartell takes us over the California border and into Nevada to visit the scariest motel in the United States, the Clown Motel. I have been to many hotels on my travels, some good, some bad, but there is one motel that is just downright scary. And it's located just over the California border in the little mining town of Tonopah. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to the world famous Clown Motel. Believe it or not, but uh, this place actually has really good reviews. This place called the Clown Motel, the scariest motel in the United States. Now, most motel owners wouldn't boast a scary night's sleep in their establishment, but that's not the case for clown motel owner Vijay Mahar. We need clown. Every time we talk about the clown, it, what do we do according to the clown? The whole clown theme has been a solid business model since 1985. Before Vijay bought the place, Leona and Leroy Dave built the motel. They did it in memory of their father Clarence Dave, who collected clown memorabilia for some reason. After Clarence's death, his kids decorated the motel with his clown collection. We count it. Today, almost 5,333 clowns. Yes, each one of the 31 rooms are decorated with disturbing clown memorabilia. But if you ask me, the scariest part of this motel is the neighbors next door. Yeah, just when you thought it uh, didn't get any creepier, uh, there is literally a cemetery uh, right outside your window here. Taking a little tour of the old Tonopah Miner Cemetery is just one of the amenities at the motel. But you may be asking yourself, who in their right mind would even want to stay here? It's pretty creepy, but it's exciting, so that's kind of why I'm here. Well, let me introduce you to Courtney Smith, who's on a solo road trip from New York. She chose to come here because the motel provides guests with an EMF reader, which is basically a digital ghost tracker, according to her. If this goes off yellow, that means they're near you, and if it goes off red, it means they're on top of you. So when I was in my room, it went off red when I was in the bathroom. So that was cool. Now, most people would probably just pack up and leave. I don't know if I can stay in there. Not Courtney, though. She actually went out to the graveyard and took some pictures. So those are like spirits just kind of wandering. Courtney only stayed one night, but Keith and Althea Hall are here every day cleaning the motel. And yes, they have some ghost stories, too. So I can feel them sometimes, the back, like oh. I have. Like here, here. Not a week goes by that the husband and wife cleaning duo doesn't hear a strange voice, see items knocked over, or feel a strange presence in the room. But if you ask them, it's no big thing. You get used to it. It's probably no surprise that the horror movie industry is capitalized on the clown motel. But what may be a surprise to you is how many movies have been filmed here. Last five years, we make four movies. So we are average is every year one movie. The endless list of movies and TV shows have provided a constant stream of advertising for the Clown Motel. But when VJ bought the place five years ago, 
he had never heard of it. We don't want nothing about the clowns. We want to change the name. But after staying just one night at the hotel, he realized the clowns were the sole reason why people from all over the world come to stay here. After buying, we know what is the value of this clown. Well, you may not get room service or a continental breakfast at the clown motel, but I can almost guarantee you that you will have an unforgettable experience. From the world famous clown motel, I'm John Bartell. Hope to see you on the back roads. I don't know if I'm gonna be able to sleep here. All right, <laughs> on that note, we're gonna say good night. Hopefully no one has nightmares. Have a good weekend, I'll see you on Monday. <laughs>Hey, it's Alex. Just wanted to say thank you so much for watching. I really love hearing from everyone and I hope that you'll stay in touch. Reach out to me on Facebook at Alex Bell TV, or you can email me at to the point at abc10.com or you can even send me a text message at 916-321-3310.